Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to the World Challenge Chapel. For everyone watching online or on YouTube, thank you so much for being with us today. If you'll get your Bible out and turn with me to Matthew chapter 12, today we're going to be dealing with verses 1 through 14. Today's message is titled, Lord of the Sabbath. Matthew 12, 1 says, At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priest in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And he went on from there and entered their synagogue. And a man was there who had a withered hand. And they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. And he said to them, Which one of you has a sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out. Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do what is good on the Sabbath. And then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out and it was restored, healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him, how that they could destroy him. And brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. God, we thank you that not only are you Lord of the Sabbath, but you are Lord and Savior of all. God, you are Savior of all who would call upon your name in salvation. God, you are a healer. God, you came to restore the broken. God, your heart is to seek and save that which is lost. God, I pray that as we look at this text, God, that our eyes would be opened to the beauty, God, and the depth of that who is the Christ, God. Lord, let us magnify and glorify the Jesus who, who took on flesh, God, who, who is our Messiah, who is our prophet, our priest, our king, God, who is making intercession for us now at your right hand. Father, I am so grateful that I may approach you because of what Christ has done. Lord, I am so thankful that your spirit lives in me and in all who are yours. God, conform us to the image of your son. God, open our eyes to the truth. God, let us have hearts for mercy, God. Lord, that we would not be those who, who seek sacrifice, God, that we would be people who have received mercy. And because we know this, we extend mercy. We ask this in Jesus Precious name, amen. God is a God of mercy. This is not a New Testament concept. This is a biblical concept that is clearly seen from the book of Genesis throughout the entirety of the Bible through the book of Revelation and is still apparent up into this very moment. God is a God of compassion. God is a God of mercy because this is a divine attribute of his unchanging character. The Sabbath was the centerpiece of the Jewish legalistic religious system of Jesus's day. And Jesus struck a deep nerve with the Jewish leaders when he violated the man-made traditions that they had added on to the observance of the Sabbath. The Greek word from which we get the word Sabbath is taken from a Hebrew word, Shabbat, which basically means to cease from labor. 
inactivity, to have a, a time of inactivity, or to take deliberate rest. In both of the stories we just read, this truth is abundantly clear. On one account, Jesus declares that he desires for mercy to be shown more than that of sacrifice. And then he rebukes the Pharisees and corrects their bad theology regarding the purpose of the Sabbath. And then in the following account, he demonstrates this by healing a man with a withered hand in the synagogue on the Sabbath. There are two very important truths we must understand from these stories. Number one, the Sabbath is for the sake of man more than the sake of God. And number two, Jesus has the right to say this because he in fact is Lord of the Sabbath. He is God, creator of the universe, savior of the world. He is Lord of all. Jesus came claiming that he was the long-awaited Messiah. And he validated this claim through the, through, by, by being uh, validated through the writings of the prophets. He fulfilled every prophecy. He knew the law inside and out. The reason Jesus knew the law better than them was because he whispered it into Moses' ear. He fulfilled the prophecies and knew he would because he spoke the prophecies to the prophets about himself. He is the long-awaited Messiah. He is the one which the Old Testament refers to as the coming one who will be a deliverer and a redeemer. They should have known this because of the way he handled the law. They should have known this because he fit, listen, not a few of the prophecies, but every prophecy. No person in the history of the world could have statistically fulfilled every prophecy that he did. Born in the right place, in the right tribe, to the right person. God says at just the right time. And then even beyond the claims that he made that were backed up by prophecy, he did the works that only God could do the mighty signs and wonders that validated that he in fact was God in the flesh. Let's get into the text. Verse one, it says, at that time, Jesus went to the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and they began to pluck heads of grain to eat. So the phrase at this time is connecting the events of the previous section of scripture in which Jesus rebuked the three towns, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, telling them that it will be better for uh, Tyre and Sidon and Sodom on the day of judgment. And then he follows this scathing rebuke by one of the most lovely and beautiful invitations of the God who took on flesh in the entire Bible as he outstretches his hand to all who would come and says, come to me and find rest. Come to me, lay down your burdens. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. So it says at this time to show us that this all happened in succession. But this follows the scathing rebuke and Jesus holding out his hand. We have to realize that even in rebuke, we see God's mercy and grace saying that if we would only come to him, if we would only surrender, if we would only lay down our burdens and repent and turn away from our sin, Jesus says, if you would only come to me, I would give you rest. So during the same time, it says Jesus and his disciples begin to walk through a grain field. And the scripture tells us that it was the Sabbath and that Jesus and his disciples were hungry, so they began to pluck heads of grain to eat. Now we must acknowledge, because I've, I've heard people talk about this in a confused fashion before, it wasn't unlawful that they were plucking the heads of grain. Because see, this is something that the Old Testament law accounted for. They had a right to, to grab heads of grain as they walked through the field. Deuteronomy 23, 24 through 25 tells us, if you go into your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your fill of grapes as many as you wish, but you shall not put any in your bag. Or if you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears with your hands, but you shall not put a sickle of your neighbor's grain 
in your bag. So it wasn't that they were taking the grain and eating it. It was the fact that they were doing what the Pharisees considered work on the Sabbath. Verse two, it says, but when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look at your disciples, what they're doing. It's not lawful to do this on the Sabbath. So we can conclude from the text based on what Deuteronomy says, because this was a sort of uh, uh, an observation or a clause in the law that was meant to serve people who were poor. We can, we can conclude from the text that Jesus and his disciple were poor, were poor. So despite what false prosperity teachers tell you, Jesus and his disciples were not people of great means. There's a quote from Charles Spurgeon that sheds light on this. He says, we incidentally learn from this story that our Lord and his disciples were poor, that he who had fed the multitudes did not use his miraculous power to feed his own followers, but left them till they did what poor men are forced to do to supply a little stay for their stomachs. So the issue was not whether it was lawful to pluck heads of grain, rather was it lawful to do this on the Sabbath? By the time Jesus had come to earth, the religious system of the Jews was utterly corrupt. They had added many man-made traditions and additional um, pieces to the law. Their interpretations and these added steps of sort of application caused the law to be untenable and confusing. The law of Moses that was presented during Jesus's earthly ministry was corrupt and bore little resemblance to the law that Moses had given in the book of the Torah. They had added many personal interpretations of what could and could not be done, especially on the Sabbath. Remember, the Sabbath was the centerpiece of the Jewish religious system. In the last verses of Matthew 11, it shows us how light the yoke and the burden of Jesus is. He's offering us freedom, but here we see the complete opposite from the Jewish teachers of the law. They lay heavy and burdensome yokes. They, they, they have a legalistic religious system that causes people to not be able to bear up under all of the conditions. These extra commandments that were added to the law by the Pharisees were grandiose. They were unbiblical, in many cases unachievable for the average Jew. And they were more rooted in superstition than they were in the law of Moses. The first century Jews were very superstitious. They did things that were very superstitious. This may have been something that they had taken out of Babylon with them. The rules about the Sabbath are as mountainous that are hanging by a hair for the scripture is scanty and the rules are many. This is a quote from a first century Jewish rabbi. Let me repeat it. The rules about the Sabbath are as mountains hanging by a hair for the scripture is scanty, but the rules are many. Verse three through five. It says, he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of presence, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor those who were with him, but only for the priest. Or have you not read in the law how the Sabbath and the priest of the temple profane the Sabbath, profane the Sabbath yet are guiltless? He's drawing this conclusion. He's saying, which, which is it? Is it wrong to do anything at all on the Sabbath? If that's true, then, then why are the priests doing twice the work that they normally do? How come there's not consistency in these additions, these man-made traditions that you've added to the law of Moses? Why are the priests guiltless? But in fact, the average person can't even feed himself when he's hungry. This doesn't make sense. This doesn't seem like the law of Moses. This is not biblical, nor is it even logical. Jesus gives the first principle of importance and priority. The idea that someone would starve to preserve a ritual 
even a godly one, goes against the very character of God. Listen, life matters more than ritual. Mercy is more important than sacrifice. The law was broken to preserve life. In the same way the book of Esther says that, that Esther went in before the king without an invitation, which was against the law, but she did it to plead for the lives of the Jews who were about to be destroyed. And she says, I'm going to, to stand and advocate for my people. And if I perish, I perish. The logic of the Pharisees, the man-made traditions added to the law had no resemblance to the character, the unchanging character of God and really had nothing to do with what Sabbath observance really meant. It would be like seeing a house that was on fire, knowing a child was inside, and that he was unable to get out. But since it's your neighbor's house and the door's locked, you let the child burn up in the fire. And when they ask you why you did this, you say, well, it's unlawful to break into someone's house. Didn't want to break his door down. This is a preposterous notion. The idea that the child's life in there, no one would have been upset by you kicking the door, saving the child and bringing him to safety. See, they were so interested in the letter of the law, not even the letter of the law of Moses, the letter of the laws that they have added to the law of Moses. They were so interested and so determined to preserve the letter of the law that they had neglected the spirit of the law altogether. They didn't care what God's intention was in the Sabbath or in the law. Now, Jesus gives this example, not because what his disciples did was against the law, but to show that there are even times when one principle trumps another. It would be like saying that there was a man. This is the, the, the sort of idea of, of enforcing the letter of the law at the expense of the spirit of the law. It'd be like there was a man who was very affluent and he lived in the inner city and he saw children who were, who were in the streets and there was crime and it was dangerous and they were dirty and there was no place to, for them to play and to be safe. So he took a chunk of money and entrusted it to a manager. And he said, listen, I want to build a place kind of like a boys and girls club where these kids can come after school. And I want the motto to be this. I want it to be a clean and safe place where children can play. Great motto. So the man builds the building and he puts toys in, he puts games in it. Everything's new and clean and nice. And the children come in and they play and they, they mess the toys up and they get them dirty. And, and the man is after the, the day's over and they leave, he looks and he says, wow, this isn't really a clean place because the children dirtied up the, the toys. So the only way we keep the toys clean is to keep them away from the children. So he puts them in a, in a, in a chest and he locks it. That will keep the toys clean. Then the children come back next day. There's no toys to play with. So they start wrestling around and one of them scrapes his knee and gets hurt. And he says, well, wow, it's clean now, but, but it's not safe. So what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to take the children and put them outside the building. And so when they showed up the next day, there was a lock on the building and the children can't go inside. And the man who financed this endeavor comes to the manager and he says, what on earth are you doing? And he says, listen, the motto says it's supposed to be a clean and safe place for children. The problem is, is he was so intent on keeping the letter of the law, he completely ignored the spirit of the law. And this is exactly what the Pharisees did. They had no intention of actually orchestrating or managing or teaching the heart of God. And here's why, because they didn't know the heart of God. They didn't understand the heart of the law. They didn't understand the point of God's ordinances, that they might be blessed, that they might be, if they lived in obedience to God, that they might be safe. This was God's desire. But the Pharisees used this to empower themselves and they used something that was meant to draw people to God as a weapon against the people. Jesus talks about the idea that, that, that David went into the temple and ate the bread of the presence. Now, this was not the right thing to do, but in the sake where they were starving, it was okay. So it would have been fine every single day just to go in and get the bread of the presence. But this, in this extreme circumstance, 
God is saying that life is more important than ritual or mercy is more important than sacrifice. And then he, he, he uses a contrast to trap them actually. Jesus is trapping them by saying, and then you said there's not supposed to be any work on the Sabbath, but how in fact are the priests guiltless when they work harder on the Sabbath than they do any other day of the week and somehow they're guiltless, which is it? Because it can't be both. Jesus uses these points to trap them by pointing out that the additions to the law were actually at the expense of the important and valid purpose of the law. If this is what you're saying is true, then, then the priests are actually profaning the temple. So they're trapped. If they affirm the work of the temple priest, they indict themselves by acknowledging that the, 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 the things they've added are not really part of the law of Moses, but rather the tradition of men. They show themselves as not understanding the law and that they were supposed to be governors and experts in. So either they say, they have to admit that the, the additions to the law, the man-made traditions aren't reconcilable. They either have to admit that or they have to admit that they don't understand the law all that much. I can imagine this infuriated them. Jesus cuts to the quick and exposes the fact that they don't understand the purpose of the Sabbath or the purpose of the law. And we know this to be true because Jesus says something greater than the temple is here. The author of the law is here. You're gonna school me in the law? Listen, before Abraham was, I am. They didn't want God. They wanted to use God to empower themselves, to enrich themselves, to step on the backs of the people, to be important. Jesus said they like to let their phylacteries hang low. They like the, the seat of prominence in the temple. They want people to call them rabbi in public. Welcome, rabbi. Have the good seat. Have the good plate. Listen, they were using God to promote themselves instead of using themselves to draw people to God, which was actually their purpose. Verse six, seven and eight. Jesus says, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless for the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is God. And he makes this claim yet again by calling himself the son of man. And then he says that the son of man is in fact the Lord of the Sabbath. The Jews valued the temple more than anything else. And this was why it was so devastating to them in the times when the temple was destroyed. They valued the temple, but not the Lord that they were meant to worship in the temple. They claimed to know and love God, but they tied up heavy burdens on those who were made in God's image. They loved the letter of the law because they loved death, but they rejected the very spirit of the law that brings life. They claim to worship in the temple, the one they claim to be waiting for, the one they claim to be sacrificing for, burning incense for, going through rituals for, leading people to, like the whole supposed centerpiece of the temple and the religious Jewish system had showed up in the flesh and they wanted nothing to do with them. Please hear me. They weren't confused. They were hard hearted. Listen, there was a no amount of miracles and prophecy. There was no display. There was no evidence that would have ever convinced them. And I'm sad to say that there are people like that too, not because God can't be clearly seen because the Bible says he can. It's because their hearts are hard and they don't want a Lord of their life. Yeah, we might want a savior. Yeah, we might want blessing, but we don't want to bow down and call him Lord. Jesus points this out by once again quoting Hosea 6.6. 6. This is the second time he's done this in the gospel of Matthew in the span of really a couple of chapters. He says, I desire mercy not sacrifice. See, because if they would have really understood the point of the temple sacrifice, then in fact, they would have loved mercy. 
It was God's mercy that let the Jews postpone God's righteous judgment by sacrificing animals until the Messiah came. Like if you actually understood the purpose of what you're doing every week and day and month and year, like all these rituals, like how could you not know? How could you not see the mercy of God? And it's because they were administrators of the law, but not benefactors of it. They felt like they were the leaders of it, but they didn't also feel that they should be subjected to it. They didn't see, listen, here's why they didn't show mercy. It's because they didn't really see how much they needed mercy. If they would have understood the purpose of the temple and the purpose of the sacrifice and how needy they themselves were, they would have understood that God is a God of mercy. God is long suffering and they would have administered the law accordingly instead of misapplying it to others without rightly applying it to themselves. They would have not ad added additional rituals and additional, additional restrictions and additional traditions. And they would have been glad at Jesus' appearing. Listen, if they would have been subjecting themselves to the law, they would have been longing for a Messiah. They would have been glad at his appearing. They would have been thankful that the king had come, that he was going to make things right, that he was going to take the heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. Jesus declares himself as the son of man, and then he declares that the son of man is the Lord of the Sabbath. And then he went home and let the Pharisees be. No, not at all. Then after he, he shames them by trapping them in these two examples, these principlematic examples that they wouldn't be able to reconcile with each other, then he walks right into their synagogue and he's about to show them what mercy looks like. Verse nine and 10, he went on from there and entered their synagogue and a man was there with a withered hand and they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? so that they might accuse him. Jesus walked directly into the heart of their distortion, a place meant for the worship of God, where people were meant to find the mercy of God, a place Jesus says is meant to be a house of prayer and showed the heart of God that they had buried in all the additions and man-made traditions that they had piled on the commandments to observe the Sabbath and to keep it holy. The words of the Pharisees, like in many other times they spoke, in this case, their own words indict them as they acknowledge, hear me, they weren't doubting that Jesus could heal. Think about this. There's a man here who has the ability to raise the dead, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to take withered hands and fix them, to tell lame men to rise and walk, to touch the eyes of the blind that they may have sight. They should have been like orchestrating a way for Jesus' healing ministry to have a tour around the area. Here's the indicting part. It says they know he can heal. They weren't worried about the, the hurting people all outside the walls of this place who needed healing. They weren't even worried one bit about this man who had suffered through life with a withered hand. They literally proposed him to him, literally for one reason, so that they could accuse him. How sick and twisted is the religion of men? Hear the words of the Pharisees, indict them even though they don't realize it as they acknowledge that Jesus has the ability to heal, heartless towards the man with the withered hand, giving no consideration to the fact that maybe the man doing all these miraculous works might actually be who he claimed to be. Here's a question for the Pharisees. If not him, then who? Like, what are you expecting? There's some of you who have all these conditions on God. There's some of you who are looking for a Jesus that says the things your itching ears wants to hear, that lets you live the way you want, that lets you be the Lord of your own life. 
But he's saying, listen, I've come to seek and save you. I can give you life. I can free you from sin. I can give you eternal life. And you go, yeah, but I want some other stuff too. How come this didn't work out? How come that didn't work out? That person, just like the Pharisees, has no idea how desperate they are for this savior, for this miraculous healer. If not him, then who? If not this Jesus, then who? What are you waiting for? They chose the man, hear me, the Pharisees chose the man with the withered hand because his malady was not life-threatening, which the traditions that they had added said that life-threatening injury was an exception. You could seek medical treatment on the Sabbath if your condition was life-threatening, like it couldn't wait for a day. So they brought a man whose malady was not life-threatening so that they could trap him in this condition. Their only motive was to do anything possible to undermine, discredit, and neutralize their perceived threat that Jesus brought to their institution. They would not allow anything to stand in the way of them holding on to their power. Hear me, not even God himself. In these stories, the words and actions of Jesus reveal several things about the true and biblical Sabbath observance. When we look back at the Old Testament, when we look back at the, at the law of God that was given through Moses. Number one, the Sabbath does not restrict doing things that are necessary. The idea that you have to count, you only have, you know, so many steps you're allowed to take on the Sabbath or it's work added by men. The idea that you can prepare food if you're hungry, added by men. The idea you couldn't do necess necessary things. It was, the idea of the Sabbath was to rest and to refrain from working. But I mean, it's so ridiculous. Even to this day, if you go to Israel, there are elevators that run in buildings. You've got your Gentile elevator where you press the button and you go to the floor and it takes you down to where you're going. And then you've got the Jewish elevator. The Jewish elevator, you're not, you don't press any buttons. It just stops on every floor, all the way up and all the way down because pressing the button is working. So if it's a 30 floor building, you're gonna have to stop at every floor. This is the insanity of the additions and the restrictions that were added by these men. The Sabbath does not restrict doing things that are necessary. This is something we weigh out in our heart. Number two, the Sabbath does not restrict acts of mercy. And number three, Jesus himself said, the Sabbath does not restrict doing good. Verse 11 through 13, he said to them, which one of you has a sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out. Oh, how more valuable is a man than a sheep? So is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? And then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out and it was restored healthy like the other. This man was not at rest. This man, his hand had plagued him for a very long time. This man needed a touch from Jesus. It was lawful to show mercy on the Sabbath. It was lawful to do something good and God is good, even in spite of men. Jesus healed the man. He exposed the contradictions of the Pharisees' man-made traditions because he, he shamed them by saying, is livestock more valuable than a man? A man made in the very image of God? If I was Jesus, I would have sat down and said, I'd love to listen to this, this theological uh, explanation. Give me a seminar on why a sheep is more valuable than a man. Well, in their case, it's because sheep were valuable economic commodities. Livestock was valuable. They favored money more than they favored men. Jesus healed the man, exposed the contradictions of their man-made traditions that they valued livestock more than a fellow image bearer of God. And then he told them that it is lawful to do what is good on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath of all days, 
I mean, this is God's day. Shouldn't this be the day to do good? This was not only an indictment that exposed the hard hearts of these Pharisees, but also showed the contradictions of the scribes and the teachers of the law and their interpretations and additions to the law of Moses. In Mark's account of the same story, in Mark 2, 27 through 28, it says, And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not the man for Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. In Mark's account, he exposes the heart of the matter. With his closing verses, he says, God never intended for ceremonial, ritual, man-made traditions to stand in the way of the very character of God, which is mercy and kindness and goodness towards others. It is lawful to do what's good on the Sabbath. And Jesus leaves no question as to why his interpretation is right and theirs is not. Because the son of man is in fact the Lord of the Sabbath. God instituted the Sabbath as a day of rest for men. He gave this example and this pattern in the creation story itself. He created for six days and on the seventh day he rested. Yes, hear me, the Sabbath is holy and it is sacred and we should honor God. But the point Jesus is making here is that this, is that the Sabbath is for man, not the man for the Sabbath. The man is not a commodity. The man is not a number. The the man is not a withered hand that you bring up to make your point. Listen, the man created in the image of God is desperate for God. And the Sabbath is for the man because the man needs God and God don't need man. Yes, we owe him honor and worship and we obey him by resting and worshiping him. But the, the truth is the Sabbath was made for the man because we need God. We need his goodness. We need his mercy. Listen, we need to worship him. And we need a day set aside when that is the predominant factor, that our bodies rest, that we, 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 we cease from working and we focus on God as we find rest for our bodies and rest for our weary souls. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. But in the final verse, Verse 14, it says, but the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Hear me. The traditions of men and man-made religion is a barrier to God showing mercy and salvation. Not that God can overcome it, but these things are unnecessary hurdles, unnecessary barriers. I remember when I was growing up and I'd fallen into addiction and, and my life was chaotic. There was a, a once or twice where, you know, I would, I would think maybe I should reach out for God. Not that I was ready really, but oftentimes when I would approach Christian people, they would give me a moral spiel. Well, you need to get off drugs. You need to do better. You need to keep your promises. You need to get a haircut. You need to get some better clothes. You need to be an upstanding moral citizen and life will be better with you. Listen, they weren't wrong about some of those things. I might've had the will, but I didn't have the power. And Jesus has the power. He has the power to crush, the power to judge, the power to pour out his wrath, but he restricted those things. And he came to us not to condemn us, but to save us. And he's holding his hand out saying, come to me as you are and I will give you rest and I will change you. We want the guy with the withered hand to fill out a form and come back next week. We wanna clean him. Listen, an old country preacher told me something one time that was so powerful. I probably butcher it a little bit. But he said, you can't clean fish you haven't caught. We're not bringing people to a temple. We're not trying to desperately hope that we can add one more person to our life group or that we can write in our report as pastors that that five more people raised their hand last Sundays. We're looking at people who are hurting and broken just like we were. And we're trying to bring them to Jesus. 
who can heal them, who can help them. Listen, there are ways that we live godly lives. Yes, we are moral people. Yes, we obey the word of God. But it's just like when I met my wife. The first time I met her, she was beautiful and attractive and funny. She didn't walk up to me and say, hey, I see you over here. If you want to be with me, here's a list of things you need to do. Here's the things I want. Here's the things you have to do. And, and do these things, and then maybe I'll consider dating you. Now, maybe there, are, there actually are probably some people in the world to do that, gold diggers and whatnot. But no, what happened was, is that I, I, became, I, I understood who my wife was. I, I began to love her. I began to realize I didn't want to be without her. It's not a perfect example. But at some point, I was like, I'm, I'm willing to do what I need to do. I'll, I'll deny myself of, of other people. I'll be with you in sickness and health. I'll dedicate my life to you and the children we'll have one day. The reason I did this is because she loved me and I loved her. Now, in the case of God, God don't have anything to better or to improve on. God is reaching out to us in our, in our, our lame mats. He's reaching out to our withered hands. And all he wants us to do is to reach back to him. But don't be the one who tells those people that, that Jesus won't heal them until they do a list of things first. Don't be part of any religion like that. Don't be part of the religion of mostly good people who are working hard to do better. Listen, this is American Christianity. The most popular version of American Christianity is five steps to self-improvement and theistic deism. This is what we love. That's why the self-help industry is almost a trillion dollar industry is because people love the idea that if they just do a couple of things to make their life better, that they can be better and they think somehow they'll be satisfied, but it won't be that case. What's gonna have to happen is they're going to have to become desperately aware that they need a touch from God. And, and the Lord of the Sabbath says, today is the day. When people come to church, when I invite people to my church, when I used to pastor, but today I attend a church, when I invite them there, I just wanna get them to Jesus. Yes, it's not that Jesus isn't where I am, and, but I want them to get in God's presence. I want them to find out who God is. I wanna be painfully clear about who God is. Yes, some of them are gonna reject, but I want them to know what they're rejecting. The traditions of men and man-made religion is a barrier to God. It's a barrier to God who wants to show mercy and salvation. It always has been, it always will be, but it can also be a barrier to men and women who are already saved who try to commingle God's word and God's grace with traditions and they can't seem to get the two to reconcile. If we give men dead religion, if we give men therapeutic morality, if we give men therapeutic deism, if we give men politics, if we give men denominationalism, then we give them burdens that they will not be able to bear up under and ultimately they will die in them. even if we give them only the true law of God, apart from the gospel of grace, Paul says we give them death. But if we give them Jesus, oh, but if we give them Jesus, he will give them mercy. He will give them grace. He will give them rest. Brothers and sisters, he will give them life. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath because Jesus is Lord of all. God of heaven and earth, Lord, thank you for being mindful of sinners like me and many of the other people who are listening to this. God, you didn't reach out to us because we had potential or because we were smart or because we had something to offer you. God, you set aside a day called the Sabbath so that we could rest, representing the rest that we find in you as we worship you. Yes, we rest from work. Yes, we rest from our daily and weekly activities. But God, ultimately, we rest in you. We worship you. We find satisfaction in you. Lord, if there's anybody under the sound of my voice who is not experiencing that kind of rest in you, the goodness and grace of God in the gospel, Lord, I pray that today would be that day. God, that they wouldn't take my words for this, that they would look deeply and intently into your word 
And God, that they would be um, revealed to the truth that is your salvation, that is your grace, that is your love. Lord, these things do produce obedience and change lives. But God, if we ever think that we have to change ourselves, God, to, to get you to outstretch your hand to us, we have missed your character altogether. And we've missed your son because he didn't call out to us from heaven. He came to where we were. He took on flesh. He suffered for us. He lived for us. He died for us. And God, by the power of your spirit, he rose once again and is interceding for us all at your right hand. Lord, we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.